Hi. So during this discussion with Krista Sorbe from Microsoft Research, um, I was sitting outside to take in the natural beauty uh, of Banff, where I was uh, for a workshop on quantum computing. Uh, unfortunately, it made the audio quality quite bad. Um, I have tried to clean it up as much as possible, um, but you can still hear some sort of wind noises and a bit of chatter coming in, uh, especially when I talk. Uh, so apologies to everyone again for that. Well, hello everyone. Um, thanks again for those of you who are going to join in uh, live or for those of you listening afterwards. Uh, this is episode six of Meet the Maquanics and as you can see, it might be a little bit noisy, but I thought the background would be, uh, would be quite nice to have in this. I'm currently at Banff in uh, Canada, attending a quantum computing workshop at the Banff International Research Station. So that's been quite good. And hopefully uh, on the iTunes broadcast, we'll upload a couple of uh, conversations with various people here who have, uh, who have agreed to talk to me while there's a tape recorder going. But we are doing a, a proper live stream this week, uh, basically because we're lucky enough to have Dr. Krista Swarbe from Microsoft Research, who has come in and said she's happy to have a bit of a chat. Um, considering she's extremely busy, I thought we'd take up the opportunity now before she disappears again and isn't heard from for, for six months to be able to do something like this. So Krista, thanks for uh, talking with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, we've tried to get a sort of a, a broad um, representation of the community. So we've had on uh, experimental physicists, uh, theorists, condensed matter theorists, and some foundations people. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you come from the computer science world. And uh, now you're sort of delving headfirst into quantum. So, I mean, how did that sort of come about? Well, so my background in terms of how I, how I became interested in this very exciting field, um, it actually started when I was in college. I was a math major in college, and I, I was actually taking a seminar on cryptography from Andrew Wilde uh, while I was at Princeton. And he mentioned there was this model of computation, you know, a future computer that would actually be able to break uh, the RSA crypto system. So as a math major at, this, at the time, I thought this was absolutely fascinating and I wanted to learn more and so much more that I wanted to really understand this whole idea of different models of computation and what it means to compute and learn more about computer science more generally. So I actually started taking classes in computer science um, ended up minoring in computer science and choosing to go on to do a degree, a PhD, um, in computer science with my focus area being quantum computation. So I actually then went on to work with Al Aho, who is uh, well known for his compiler work, programming language work, uh, and then also Joseph Traub at Columbia, uh, where I did my PhD. And, you know, I was really interested in understanding fault tolerance and how do you program this device once we have it? How do you actually take an algorithm, say Shor's algorithm, uh, that allows you to perform factoring, uh, but then actually compile and optimize and, and map it all the way down to the hardware? So during my PhD, I focused on that, uh, as well as quantum error correction, and then um, actually ended up doing machine learning for a few years here at Microsoft Research. Um, and now I'm back uh, full on in uh, quantum quantum computing. So given the advancement and uh, certainly the advanced nature of classical computer science and information technology, um, how do you see it compare to the quantum side? Um, is the quantum science sort of more complementary uh, to classical techniques in computer science? Or do you really have to develop the, the quantum side from scratch? You know, I think it's, it's definitely a mix. Um, you know, I think at this point we, you know, we want to leverage all of the knowledge and the advances that come from classical computer science, from the theory of computation, from programming languages, from compilers. You know, everything we've learned there, um, computer science is really uh, a lot about formulating uh, and identifying the right layers of abstraction and then actually finding how you interface between these layers of abstraction, right? Um, especially in compilers and programming languages. And so we can definitely leverage this knowledge um, for, for quantum computing. Um, and of course, in quantum computing, we also have a whole um, range of complexity classes that have been developed. You know, when you look at 
um, all of these different complexity classes on Scott Aronson's page, you know, that he, he maintained. Um, and then the two of quantum algorithms, you know, all of these are computer science concepts on developing algorithms, looking at complexity runtimes. Um, but we also need to develop some new ideas, right? New ways to analyze algorithms. Um, we need new ways to actually program our quantum algorithms. Um, and we can definitely leverage classical computer science and, and the work there. Um, but, you know, classical computer science, we're not dealing with superposition and entanglement and, and different things. Um, so we actually need some new constructs as well. Um, so I, think it's a I may have... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it is something I've always wondered about with people coming from the, the classical computer science area or, or focusing largely on that. Because uh, as the technology is developing and, and the industry is growing, we're going to have to employ people that don't take four years of quantum mechanics, don't do quantum field theory. So when you have to deal with these new concepts such as superposition and entanglement, um, how steep of a learning curve do you think it is for somebody who really doesn't have a background in physics? Right. So I think if, if we as computer scientists and engineers do our do a, do our job well, uh, then hopefully you don't need to know all of these details. You know, after all, when we program a classical computer today, when people pick up their phone and write, you know, a mobile app, um, they don't know the details, the intrinsics um, of the internals of that phone and that device, right? And that's because it's well abstracted and and you can actually just interact with it through a very nice high-level programming language or a nice user interface, a nice GUI. Um, so I think if we do our job well, then ultimately, hopefully, we don't need a whole um, you know, range of engineers fully understanding all of the quantum mechanics uh, and all the details there uh, to actually go forth and program. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, I always try to push new people that I, that I meet to go into quantum, even if uh, even if their background isn't wholly and solely in physics. Right. Uh, but um, so another sort of a long term sort of your gut feeling. I mean, quantum computers in terms of standalone devices, sort of fast co-processors for certain problems. Um, what's your thoughts on this? You know, I like to view a quantum computer more as an accelerator, um, as we would use a GPU or or even a supercomputer. Um, I envision that a quantum computer will really be in a cloud environment. It's going to be, um, you know, not the case that all of us have a dilution refrigerator, you know, larger than our size, <laughs> sitting in our kitchen, right? <laughs> Next door on the regular fridge. Um, it's it's really going to be something where you're interacting with a quantum computer through the cloud remotely. Hopefully, it's a cluster of quantum computers, just as you access maybe an HPC cluster today. Um, and you're running jobs that way. Um, and you're either you know, seeking solutions from the quantum computer or you're you know, asking for time on the quantum computer. And, and of course, um, this quantum computer will be controlled by a classical computer. And this classical computer will be sending the instructions to the quantum computer and so on. Um, and I think, you know, the more we learn about quantum computing and what it can do well, um, you can start to envision these hybrid classical quantum algorithms where the quantum, the quantum computer really is an acceleration of a step of the algorithm or, um, you know, treated like this, this GPU type of idea, right? Yeah, yeah. So specifically, so obviously I know about um, your work and the other work uh, by people at Microsoft. So you, you focus at the moment largely on, uh, so most of the stuff that I look at is related to quantum chemistry and sort of programming languages and simulation languages for quantum computing. So maybe give us a, a little bit of a, you know, the, the five minute cliff notes as to, to what these projects are. Sure. So I think um, perhaps... Uh, you know, right now, one of the most exciting things is that we have released our software architecture, um, our software architecture publicly. And so on GitHub Liquid, which is, um, Liquid is our software architecture for quantum computing, it has a, a language um, that's based on the circuit model for quantum computing. Um, and then it also has a simulation environment. And so you can actually write 
um, you can write code, uh, you know, to perform a quantum algorithm in this language within Liquid, and then actually compile it uh, to quantum circuits and simulate it in this environment. Um, so that's been a large focus of our group uh, recently. It really enables you to do, you know, research in new quantum algorithms. Um, but I also like it for, you know, as we were just speaking about, um, if you haven't done, you know, years of physics or quantum mechanics, um, as a computer scientist or engineer, it's a great way to jump in, uh, learn a new language, and then also learn some new concepts. So I see it also as a great academic tool um, and a wonderful way to um, actually learn about quantum computing, whether it's in a course or on your own. Um, in addition, of course, to those of us who are doing our research. Yeah, so I mean, when, when we were talking with Austin Fowler a couple of weeks ago, he, he seemed to, I'm always of the opinion that the, the more, more interesting quantum algorithms are gonna come when we have a quantum computer to play with, or more, yeah. more accurately, when the general public has a quantum computer to play with. Um, he sort of pushed back against that. He says, no, 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 no. quantum simulators are, are more than enough to do the job if you make them intuitive and interactive. Um, certainly liquid is, is targeted a lot within the academic community and, and the, the quantum computing community. Um, but is it accessible for, for general people to download it and just have a bit of fun and see what they come up with? Yes, you know, I, th I think it really is. Um, I've actually been meeting with uh, a group of three people here at Microsoft who who were at an internal talk um, about something else and, and approached me and said, I really want to learn, you know, we really want to learn more about quantum computing. And, and they're, um, you know, computer science majors who now work here as developers. Um, and they really just want to learn the subject. So they have downloaded Liquid and we meet every other week for 30 minutes to an hour um, just talking about what quantum computing is. And they try little programs in Liquid and this is a way to get, you know, that they're a way um, for them to get started and start understanding the concepts. So, so they're just, so they, they haven't had quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah, have they found anything interesting yet? Well, so far just learning about you know what it means to have superposition, entanglement, interference, uh, kind of just the concepts right now, uh, and they haven't necessarily started playing with it with regard to you know developing new algorithms. Um, but you know I, I, I'm sure they'll get there. Yeah, 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 I can imagine they're usually pretty smart people. Um, so how did Microsoft get into? So you you mentioned that you joined Microsoft before you got back into quantum computing, and then you you obviously migrated over to, to lead the QR group. So how did Microsoft start getting involved? Right. So Microsoft's history in quantum computing actually goes uh, much further back than when I joined Microsoft. So I I joined Microsoft in two thousand six. Um, and Microsoft actually was already uh, involved in quantum computing um, as early as the late 90s. So really our effort here, um, I think we, we owe to Michael Friedman, who heads uh, Station Q, Microsoft Station Q in Santa Barbara. That's the theoretical physics wing. Uh, we're part of Station Q. We're the kind of the computer science wing of Station Q. And, and the Santa Barbara lab is the theoretical physics wing. So Mike actually, uh, you know, really began these efforts um, with Craig Mundy, who at the time was, um, let's say, equivalent to CTO of Microsoft. And Craig and Mike developed Station Q, um, began having discussions around that. You know, it's pretty remarkable. In the late 90s, um, Alexei Kataev was here, Mike Friedman, uh, Daniel Gottesman, Chet Nyack. Uh, there are pretty incredible people here in the late 90s working on quantum computation. Um, and so through that and through the research coming out of their work, looking at topological quantum computation, um, they actually began, uh, they began discussions around starting a group to really focus on that here. Um, and it led to the, uh, you know, it led to beginning Station Q um, in the mid-2000s, around 2006. Right, so it's been a long time coming, um, and I suppose you obviously don't read the minds of the higher-ups at Microsoft, but where do they see themselves fitting in? Because you don't develop hardware at Microsoft, you're all either software or theory, right? Well, so, you know, we do develop hardware at Microsoft. Um, we are really, you know, we're hardware... Oh, sorry, 
Well, well let's quant see. quantum hardware. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Quantum hardware. <laughs> the Sony yes. Xbox. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Microsoft hardware. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the yeah, in terms of quantum hardware, so our approach has been rather than do that, you know, directly in a lab here on the Redmond campus. Um, our approach has been to really collaborate um, and create more of a kind of intellectual coalition around the world. Um, and so we actually have collaborators around the world that are doing the hardware as part of our efforts. Um, they're not in-house, you know, here at the Redmond campus, but uh, we actually work, um, work quite closely with Charlie Marcus at University of Copenhagen, for example, um, Leo Cowenhoven at Delft, David Ryan at Sydney, um, Leo DiCarlo at Delft, um, and these and these people are all looking at um, aspects of either topological quantum uh, quantum computation um, in some form or, or another. Um, whether it's the control of the hardware, the actual qubits being these nanowire systems, um, or how you might measure those systems out, um, all of these different things. Are so you do link in with a variety of different systems. It's, it's not like some other efforts where they're, they're focusing solely on superconductors or solely on diamonds. You, you're trying to put your fingers in a lot of pies, as it were. Well, yeah, so in terms of hardware, we're very, very interested in topological qubit um, that we have, you know, hopefully intrinsic um, protection against noise. So these, 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 these models, these qubits that are based on anions, um, Ising anions, these Majorana uh, nanowire systems. So, so we are putting uh, quite a bit of interest in that space. Um, we are also, you know, open and looking at other ideas as well. And I, I think that's where uh, our group here in Redmond, the, the, the quark part of Station Q, you know, we're really looking at a whole variety, uh, compiling to a whole variety of different qubit designs. We're looking at, you know, a whole variety of different quantum algorithms and so on. So, uh, so it's not that we're particularly um, overly area, but we are really interested in that. Uh, come it's an interesting distinction, actually, because obviously we started this podcast in order to help support. Uh, the Mechonics game, which is also based on topological uh, quantum computing, but a different form of topological computing. Mechonics deals with these topological codes, but what you're talking about with topological quantum computing is slightly different, isn't it? Right. So, um, so perhaps as a computer scientist, going back to abstractions, uh, you could have, you know, you could think of it as having um, some amount of hardware level error correction. Uh, where your qubits themselves have some natural error correction in hardware. And then you could think you also have this overlaying, um, overlying software level of error correction. And so I like to think of the topological qubits you're, you're mentioning and that you've looked at in your research um, in Austin and others, you know, surface code, torque code, color code. Uh, these are all considered, you know, topological codes. Um, and indeed, they 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 enable error correction, right? They enable fault tolerance. You can perform it And you can do this in conjunction with whatever underlying hardware in terms of your qubit representation, right? So if topological qubits aren't, you know, it, depending what their error rate is, you may still also overlay an amount of software error correction. Uh, so, so you can use these together, but indeed, um, one is kind of at the hardware level and one is more at the software level. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, they're not codes, they're, they're, they're fundamentally protected by physics rather than computer science. That's right. Exactly, yeah. that's, that's what I meant by the software, hardware. Yeah, 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 exactly. Really, in software, we can overlay that through the compiler, uh, these topological codes. Um, and then they can still make topological qubits out of hardware eventually. So, do you have a preference? In terms of in terms of uh, anionic computing versus sort of the more standard model? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, naturally, um, I'm a fan of topological qubits um, because I think their promise, um, you know, their promise is that they will have better error rates um, than what, what we sometimes refer to as the, the, a conventional qubit, say a superconducting qubit or an ion trap qubit. Um, so these, these topological qubits um, of course, we don't have a full qubit yet, 
in these systems. Um, but, but the theory points to having the promise of, you know, error rates that might be like 10 to the minus 6 or, or, or better, say 10 to the minus 9. Um, and, and that promise is, is quite interesting because then overall, uh, potentially we could use far fewer resources to do a calculation than would be required if we have a qubit that has error rates, say 10 to the minus 4. So, so of course, a, a, the promise of an error rate of 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 9 is quite uh, quite intriguing for for us theorists looking at quantum error correction, where the overhead mm -hmm. can be daunting. Um, so this can dramatically reduce the overheads required to to scale out an algorithm. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I th I think these are quite compelling uh, in terms of a path forward. Yeah. So I mean, I I, I tend to bring this topic up, especially from anyone who who talks to me who's from the industry side. Um, we've certainly seen. Um, a lot of interest, especially in the last 18 months now, there's been a lot of government investment worldwide, but um, sort of, as I, as I call it, the big boys are coming in. Microsoft and Google seem to be more prominent, IBM, uh, Intel has just invested in, in the Danish effort. Um, so do you think that this is now starting to push out beyond the academic sector and really now starting to get much more industrialised? Do I think that? That. Yeah, yeah. Where do you sort of see it going? Is it, is it still going to be an academic pursuit, or is it really now starting to move into industry and out of the universities? Well, I, I think we still, you know, I think ideally we have, um, and as I mentioned in terms of how we've set up our efforts here, you know, I really see moving forward in a synergistic way with universities. Um, I think indeed um, companies are investing and and you know, how remarkable and wonderful that is um, that companies are investing in this space, um, you know, because many of us have, were in this space, you know, you know, 15 years ago and, and there, was, there was not the investment we're seeing today and the interest and the excitement. Um, and with the amazing research that's gone on, I think in the last 10 years across the field, uh, now companies are interested and, and they're seeing the promise. And I, I just think this is wonderful for our field um, and for you know whether you're at an academic institution or at an industrial lab, um, I think it's wonderful on both sides. And I think you know for us, we really do believe in working with um, professors and academics uh, in this space. And we don't believe that we will do it kind of go it all alone. Uh, we continue to have consultants um, at universities around the world. And that really allows more rapid advancement, more rapid education, understanding um, of, of our research and our joint research with academic institutions. Um, Great. Together. Uh, this is a big project, right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like the Manhattan Project. If we, if we don't come together, um, I think you know, it's, we, we're unlikely to make uh, and overcome all of the big technical challenges that we face uh, in this field, because there there are large technical challenges. Um, so we'll need to work together to overcome those, I think. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. So in the next sort of, where do you, where's your group heading in terms of sort of the big sky broad projects in the next five years? Or are you just going to sort of see where the experimentalists go and try to adapt yourselves as best as possible? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of directions that we're really excited about. Um, of course, one is looking at how we control and program and optimize um, the actual algorithm on the device. So Liquid is really the first step towards that. Um, so Liquid is a simulator with a language, um, but now we are gearing up uh, to eventually uh, release something called Solid. Uh, this is a bit of a, a play on words. It's the son <laughs> of liquid. Um, and solid, solid will actually be a more full framework um, that's very modular, that allows you to compile to hardware, um, to optimize that for that hardware and so forth. So liquid you can think of as a really just a, a simulator backend that could be plugged into to solid as one of the things you may compile to, um, right? 
um, but Solid will also allow you to compile to hardware. So one thing our group is really looking at is, you know, that's a huge stack of, of um, different pieces, different abstractions, different algorithms that we need to pull together. How do you optimize, you know, a big area of research for us recently, um, the work of Vadim Klushnikov, John Yard, Alex Boshrov, Martin Rotler, um, really starting to look a lot at synthesis. How do you take an arbitrary unitary and then synthesize an optimal sequence um, of discrete gates, of, of gates drawn from a discrete set uh, where that sequence is optimal, it's short, it's, it's not too expensive in terms of the number of non-Clifford okay. gates. Um, that you can view as a, you know, a compilation strategy. So that's just one piece within this large solid framework uh, that's plugged in in order to allow an algorithm to be mapped to hardware. Uh, so there's a lot more to do there. Um, how do you, and, uh, and I think you've looked at this <laughs> actually. Yeah. Right? I don't, I don't quite have your resources, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're looking at some of your research and, and you know, how do, once you apply error correction, how do you optimize that um, and maintain fault tolerance? How do you go about laying that out on your hardware uh, so that you minimize the resources required and the time required? Um, all of these are really great um, questions and, and things we're looking at. Um, so that's just, of course, one direction. I think the other direction we're super interested in um, in looking at what are the killer applications going to be. Um, what what will we do with a quantum computer? Uh, can we simulate some of this in advance of having full scalable hardware? Um, and as we see hardware emerge, um, that's you know more than just a few qubits. Um, as we move to seeing fifty qubit chips you know, 100 qubit chips. What do we do with those chips? Um, can we show quantum supremacy uh, on these chips? And so we're, we're thinking about those ideas as well. Um, and then of course, working with our experimental partners on modeling, understanding noise, understanding what error correction scheme might make sense given the size, um, or can you do an algorithm without error correction? If there's a small number of gates you're gonna be running, say, say you know, a thousand, <laughs> thousand gate circuit, uh, does that do something interesting? So, so we're kind of investigating all of these paths, um, which with our colleagues at Station Q and our colleagues around the world. Um, so, so I mean, do, does your group um, do you delve beyond computing? I mean, do you look at uh, you know um, uh, infrastructure and protocols for say large scale quantum internet networks or metrology networks, or are you really sort of focused? within the computational space at this point? Yeah, I, I would say right now we're really focused on the computational space. Um, there's plenty to keep us busy there. Um, but we do try to stay up to date and following the uh, the communication side. And oops, are you there? No, I've got you back. Sorry, lost you for a second. Yeah, so uh, we do try to stay up to date with regard to the communication and networking side, but I would say uh, right now we're we're pretty focused on the computation side. Okay, um, well we're coming up to towards forty minutes now, so the the, the last thing I do before uh, before ending the show is I, I do try to hold everyone's feet to the fire and sort of say, what do you think is going to happen in the next five to ten years in terms of development? At least that way we can come back in a decade and say which one of you was right, which one of you were way off the mark. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yeah. I make everybody do this, so I can't let you not. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. So, um, right. So, you know, I, it's funny, I was asked this question recently uh, in another context. Um, and, you know, I think in the next four to five years, looking at the progress of experiment, um, I think we will see, um, you know, a chip with um, tens, maybe a hundred qubits, let's say, uh, in the next four to five years, maybe somewhere between 50 and 100 qubits on that chip. Um, and I believe that we'll do something uh, that shows quantum supremacy on that chip. Um, I think in terms of doing something really interesting, it's uh, in, and in terms of you know solving a problem that we really can't solve classically that is of interest to the real world and of interest maybe to to researchers or businesses or enterprise or something. Um, you know, I think it'll be a bit beyond that. So you think five to ten years be pushing it for something commercially 
popular. Well, actually, no. I, I mean, I think at the at the the, the close time end of that, <laughs> at the at five years, um, I think we'll be doing something with these chips. I think at the ten year, we'll be doing something really interesting with these chips. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, well, last thing uh, I'd like is, do you have anything you want to plug? Any upcoming presentations, any upcoming events or anything happening at Microsoft or around the world that you'd like to mention? Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll make a little plug um, for some of the work I think that's being presented at Banff this week, uh, where you are in that beautiful location with the mountains behind you. Yes, it's um, wonderful. Uh, so, you know, Nathan Weeb is there, and I, I believe he presented some new results we have around actually performing a quantum computation um, to understand uh, things like nitrogenase, um, which is what happens when um, basically if we want to uh, produce artificial fertilizer and we want to do that efficiently, we'd like to understand um, nitrogenase and how it behaves because it naturally does this efficiently. Um, biologically uh, so so those results were were, we're looking uh, to post soon on you know what size quantum computers really required to do that so Nathan Weeb Matthias Troyer Marcus Ryer um, and Dave Wecker and I have been working on that work and and I'm quite excited about those results coming up yeah those vi those videos Banff actually puts online so I, I will put a link down in the description uh, to all the videos and yeah, so I was there for Nathan's talk, and it was quite interesting. We had a few discussions after dinner about some aspects of it. So I would encourage people to go online. All the talks from the Bank of, uh, Bank of Workshop are there uh, to, to watch or download. Um, and some of them are really, really quite good. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. So, so yeah, um, usually this, this is about it. We usually don't, don't try to go too long since this is targeted towards a lay person. And they don't want to necessarily sit here and listen for three hours even though I'm sure we could talk for three hours on this kind of stuff. So uh, once again I'd like to thank Krista for, for joining us today and uh, hopefully we'll be uploading some audio only uh, versions of Meet the Mechonics which uh, we'll have a few more discussions with some people at BAMF who agree to it. Um, those will be available on our iTunes and SoundCloud channels. Uh, apart from that, we will try to have a, a next guest uh, in the next week or so. Uh, there's some few people lined up. We've got to line up some schedules. So once again, just log on to our Twitter feed or our YouTube channel or Facebook page, and I'll post as soon as we have somebody else confirmed. Uh, so for the meantime, Krista, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Everyone go play the game. <laughs> yes, go play the game. Exactly.